I think it's so important to recognize the people in our life who have helped us to become the people that we are. I think it's important to recognize those people in our life who have been the catalyst, the encouragers for the dreams, the goals, the aspirations that we have. I want to recognize a few people here who have been instrumental in my development and in the development of this ministry. First, Larry. <laughs> when I became a deputy sheriff in 2001, Larry was instrumental in bringing me, mentoring me, encouraging me, educating me, really teaching me how to balance the challenges of working in a very harsh environment where you're constantly surrounded by negativity yet remaining Christ-focused. Larry, thank you, brother. Thank you for everything you've taught me over the years. My second CrossFit workout in 2001 was with our videographer, <laughs> David Lees. And David Lees has been instrumental in helping me keep my focus on Christ through my training in CrossFit. So David, thank you, brother. <laughs> now, here's where it gets really exciting, very timely. I met Josh Montz thanks to, where's Dave Ramos? Thanks to Dave. Dave knew us both, and Dave knew the similar paths that we were on. It's amazing that our paths hadn't crossed sooner, yet Dave knew these two guys have to meet. So he decided to introduce us on live radio. <laughs> And it was during that live radio episode that this idea of FaithWorks ministry started to take shape. And Josh was the encourager. He's like, yeah, let, let's do that. Let's, let's make this happen. We all, the three of us, we have a big heart for veterans, for trying to help those people that have served our country and who have experienced catastrophic injury, whether that injury be physical or even worse, mental, emotional. What's interesting, when we look to the challenges of our life, the key component to successfully overcome any challenge is faith. Thus, the term for our ministry, faith works. We always come back to that. We always come back to the name of the ministry. <laughs> the fact that having faith in God factually works in our life. There's no mystery about it. We're designed to co-create. We're designed to work in harmony with God. When we have faith and the key, when we work that faith, then and only then can we really step into the amazing person that God created us to be. The analogy would be this. Imagine if someone came into the gym and they said, tell me everything you can about CrossFit. We could break it down for that person. We could explain the science, 
the methodology, the rationale, the power output component, we can break everything down. Yet at the end of the day, that person has to work out <laughs> in order to experience the benefit of CrossFit. Otherwise, it's just theory, just knowledge, which is useless unless we put that knowledge to work. That's the way that God wants us to experience Him. It's not just a matter of knowing about God. We have to understand God and we have to work our faith in our life. The best way to do that, the reason that we love the component of faith works is that it allows us naturally to look to the warrior archetype. Because if there was ever an archetype, if there was ever a perspective that we could utilize to really understand how to work faith in our life, it's the warrior archetype. That is the pinnacle, that is the premier way to understand how faith can work in our life. Roberto, will you turn the radio completely off? Yeah, it's like my favorite song playing right now. I can hear the background. <laughs> Just like a lullaby, Just start singing. Thank you, brother. When I started in law enforcement, one of my mentors said these words to me. He said, Greg, if you tell me the truth, I will believe you. If you tell me a fact, I will listen. However, if you share with me a story, then I will remember. My goal for you, my friends, is that you would remember the story that we share today. Because this story is a beautiful example, perhaps one of the best examples from the Holy Bible of how the warrior, a pinnacle warrior, utilized both an amazing amount of faith, unshakable faith in God, yet they were also a warrior. Therefore, they utilized tools, they utilized techniques, they utilized strategies to enhance and to essentially make their faith work. The story I'm referring to is none other than David and Goliath. And many of you who are here for our first ministry likely recall this is the same story that we shared at the first ministry. Why are we sharing it again? We return to the warrior tradition to answer that question. In the warrior tradition, it was believed that stories had to be shared three times. The same story had to be shared three times. The reason for that is the first time the story was shared, all that we do is hear some words. That's it. We just hear some words. The second time that same story is shared, we listen. The third time the story is shared, we understand. For some of you, this is the first time you've heard the story. For others, the second. Perhaps others have heard this story many, many times. And today might be the opportunity to fully understand the amazing message that the story of David and Goliath has in store for us. Let's go back in time. Set the context, set the stage for this incredible battle. Two armies have squared off in a valley. There's a small clearing at the bottom of this valley. They are stacked up, these two armies, in such a battle formation that what would happen at the onset of the battle is they would run down this hill and they would engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the valley floor. Classic battle formation. However, the kings on both opposing sides of the army, rather than exposing massive bloodshed, decided that they would have a single combat contest to determine which army would win. That's important to understand. There had been an agreement. You send your best warrior, you send your best warrior, they will fight in single combat. The winner of that single combat fight, that army prevails. The other side surrenders. That was the agreement. Seemed like a good agreement until King Saul and the Israelites realized the opposing army had Goliath. 
a giant. In addition, the opposing army had armor. They had battle armor. Technology favored the opposing army. They were all wearing armor. Goliath walks onto the battlefield. By historical account, Goliath is nearly seven feet tall. Goliath strolls on to the battlefront. Then, crickets. <laughs> Not a single soldier from the army of the Israelites dared make onset against Goliath. For 40 days, they would attempt to gain enough courage to fight Goliath. 40 days went by. The Bible tells us that during those 40 days, soldiers from the Israelite army would rally. They would try to pump themselves up. Then when they thought they had enough courage, they would run to the battlefront. Once again, they'd see Goliath and they'd run back. 40 days that took place. We've all experienced that to some extent in our life, trying to get ourselves rallied up, trying to motivate ourselves to face that challenge. And I'm sure there's all been an experience in our life where we never quite have what it takes. Those moments of regret where, oh, I should have done it. I should have gone for it, yet we did not. Yet that's a historical account of what's been the human condition since the beginning of time. 40 days went by where they could never quite muster enough courage, enough strength, enough fortitude to face Goliath. Well, one day along comes David. David was not a soldier in the army. However, David was a warrior. There's a key difference between being a warrior and a soldier. David was a warrior. The reason that David came onto the battlefield that day was not to fight. He came onto the battlefield that day to bring his brothers who were in the army, who were soldiers, food. He was bringing lunch to his brothers. As he approached the battle front, he saw the scene unfolding. The same scene that had been unfolding for the past 40 days. He saw a bunch of soldiers trying to rally themselves, run up to the battlefront, see Goliath, and run away. And he thought to himself, what's, the bit, what, what's going on? So he walks to the battlefront. He looks at Goliath. And he says, I can take this guy. <laughs> I've got this. Where are you guys going? I can take this guy. Immediately the opposition, the chirping, the naysayers, the negativity starts to stir. Because do you know what profession David was in? Shepherd, not soldier. He was not in the army. He was not a trained combatant. He didn't have a weapon. He had a slingshot. He was wearing the apparel, the clothing, the uniform of a shepherd. And they said, you can't possibly, that's a trained soldier. Not only is that a trained soldier, look at the size of that giant. You can't possibly take that guy. He said, yes, I can. Where's the king? He goes to the king and says, King Saul, let's not sacrifice any of your soldiers. I can take that giant. Let me fight on behalf of your army. Let me face the giant. King Saul says, you can't possibly face and take this giant. There's no hope. Look at you. You're a shepherd. What's interesting about King Saul, King Saul was the largest of the Israelite army. If there was anyone that should have been facing Goliath, do you know who it was? King Saul. Isn't it interesting that the person that should have been facing the giant, the person that should have been in front, the king now says, 
to someone volunteering to lead the way, you can't do it. I'm sure there's been times in our life when someone's told us, someone's told you, you can't do it. The reason they're telling you you can't do it is because they never could. That's a classic example of King Saul, a historical figure from the Bible telling David, you can't do it. David says, yes, I can. The reason David was so confident, he tells King Saul, I've taken other giants. I've taken down lions. I've taken down bears. I have survived those encounters. I can assure you, king, I can take this giant. The king agrees. However, there's a contingent rule put in place. The king says, very well, you can fight. However, you cannot go into battle wearing the apparel, the uniform of a shepherd. You've got to put on my armor. David puts on the armor of the king, walks around a little bit. He says, I, I can't fight with this armor on. He specifically says, I haven't tested this. He takes it off. He refuses to wear armor into battle. Then David goes down to the brook, to a river, where he gathers five stones. He selects these stones. There's a lot of rocks in the river. Yet he meticulously selects five. He puts those five into what would be, in modern terms, an emo kit, a magazine pouch, the pouch of a shepherd. He stores his ammunition. Then he walks back up the hill to the battlefront. And then, my favorite part of the story, he doesn't walk towards Goliath, he runs. He runs right towards Goliath. As he's running towards Goliath, he says, I come to you in the name of Jehovah, traditional Jewish name for the name of God. I come to you in the name of God and I will surely bring you down. Now, as he's saying this, he removes one of the rocks from his pouch places it in his sling, he's running and gunning, throws the rock, pinpoint accuracy, because the only part of Goliath that is not protected by armor is right here, between the eyes. And that is exactly where the rock hits Goliath. As we would say in the Marine Corps, one shot, one kill. Goliath goes down. Because we have martial artists in the room, modern day example, modern day technique in the UFC that David utilized was the Superman punch. <laughs> he ran across the cage and boom, Superman punch took down Goliath. Modern day SWAT application. That is the tactic that is employed by special operations and SWAT teams. SWAT teams, special operations, no longer stand in place and shoot. They step offline, they address the threat, and they move towards the danger. David was the first UFC fighter. David was the first SWAT operator. David was the first special operations officer. He utilized the tools, the techniques, the tactics, the strategies of the modern day warrior. Yet, he also had an unshakable faith in God. He said, I come to you in the name of Jehovah, in the name of God, my strength, I come to you. He had faith and he worked his faith, utilizing the tactics, the techniques, the strategies, those key words from the military law enforcement profession. He utilized both. Why did David gather five rocks? One giant. Why five rocks? Warriors always go into battle prepared. The unknown and unknowable. It turns out 
Goliath had brothers. The Bible tells us one of Goliath's brothers was not only a giant, he had six fingers on each hand and six toes. What would happen if after David brought down Goliath, his brother appeared on the battlefront? He was prepared. You see, God told David, I am for you. The Bible tells us if God is for us, who can be against us? David knew he could overcome Goliath. Yet he didn't go into battle with one rock. He went into battle with five. What would happen if after David brought down Goliath, some of the opposing army charged? He needed to continue to be able to defend himself and the other soldiers. That is a warrior. Warriors are prepared. Warriors train. Warriors have faith in God and warriors work that faith. Now, as you probably can tell by now, I am passionate about the warrior spirit. We often talk in the gym about being a warrior, a modern day warrior, no less. The ministry teaches the Bible through the context of being a warrior, which certainly begs the question, what is a warrior? Who is a warrior? Many people think a warrior is defined by what you do, which is a huge mistake. Because I know many of you who serve in the warrior profession have undoubtedly served in a warrior profession, yet not with warriors. <laughs> so we know, therefore, that just because you're in a warrior profession, does not necessarily mean you're a warrior. And I know from experience, I know many of you as well, some of the greatest warriors that we've known were not in a warrior profession, yet they still embrace the spirit of the warrior. What is a warrior? The way that we define a warrior in the ministry, a warrior is a vessel of service. A warrior strives to be of service to other people people. If we want to be of service to other people, the other side of the coin of service is mastery. We have to master ourselves in order to be of service to other people. How long do you think it took David to master the sling? The sling in historical combat was such a challenging weapon to utilize, let alone master, that few could do it. It took David years to cultivate the skill, the proficiency in that weapon, that tool, to be able to fire a rock and hit a target less than an inch big. However, having all the tools in the world is useless without faith. We have to have both. The reason I say this is that it turns out, the Bible tells us, there were 700 other soldiers in the Israeli army that could fire with equal precision the shot that David fired. There were 700 other soldiers that day on the battle that could have taken the same shot. Specifically, the Bible says there were 700 that could shoot a rock and hit a target the size of a hair. A hair! That's accuracy. That's a sniper. 700! Yet, David was the only one that took the shot. And he wasn't even in the army. So we see right away that you can have the latest and greatest tools. You can have the newest techniques, the newest strategies. However, what separates people has everything to do with what's happening in here and in here. 
our temple. Isn't that amazing? 700 people that day on the battle could have taken the same shot, yet only one did. Let's read from the Bible because we also have to understand specifically, I want to go right to the source. We have to really understand the type of giant that David was facing. I want to read you a historical account of the type of giant that David was facing. I read this recently and was blown away. This is absolutely incredible. Then a champion named Goliath came out from the Philistine camp. According to the New Testament, King James Law Enforcement Bible. <laughs> Get this. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. And he wore a bronze helmet and a bronze scale armor that weighed, the armor weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins and a bronze sword was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam. A weaver's beam is six feet long. His spear was six feet long, taller than me. His spear was like the shaft of a weaver's beam, and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, get this, in addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. Did you know that part of the story? Me neither. A shield bearer, this is a traditional battle tactic. A shield bearer held a shield in front of the warrior, ready to sacrifice himself for the warrior. David walks up. Not only does he now have to face Goliath, his shot has to maneuver around a shield bearer who's standing in front of Goliath. What else is so interesting about the description, the nearly paragraph long description of the giant Goliath is in the Bible, there's not another account with such description of any other figure. There's no account to this degree of specificity of Jesus Christ, of Paul, of John. None of the good characters in the Bible are described to this level of detail, yet the giant is. Why is that? Why would there be such account, such description of the giant? of the problem, of the negativity? Well, I think in our heart, our intuition is stirring. We know why. Where do we tend to gravitate in our mind? Most of the time, we're facing our own Goliath in our mind. Most of the time, we're building that problem up in our mind. Most of the time, we're creating our own worst enemy in our mind. That's essentially what the Bible is teaching us. It's going into such detail that any sane human being would want nothing to do with that giant. That giant is covered head to toe in armor, weighing 125 pounds, with a six foot spear and a shield bearer. Bronze armor also served another very interesting point. Bronze armor reflected the sun. This battle, as I already mentioned, was taking place in a valley during broad daylight. Not only, according to the Bible, was Goliath over six feet tall, the sun reflecting off the bronze armor would have made him appear even bigger. So let's start to get into the nitty gritty of what happened that day because this is where we can really love and embrace the spirit of the warrior. David refused armor. As David is running towards Goliath, Goliath says something really interesting. Goliath says, come to me and so that I can kill you and feed you to the dogs. Historians believe that as a result of the fact that Goliath was a giant, he also suffered from a condition that nearly blinded him. Many historians 
think Goliath was either very nearsighted or blind, which would have been another reason why his shield bearer was so important to him. The shield bearer would not only block, the shield bearer would let Goliath know where the opponent was. Had David been wearing armor, his armor would have also reflected the sun, which would have helped Goliath see the oncoming opponent. In many respects, David was wearing camouflage. Goliath couldn't see him. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> modern strategy, the tools, the tactics, the tips of a modern day warrior were employed that day by David. A warrior is a vessel of service. A warrior wants to be of service to other people. A warrior develops faith, yet a warrior also works out. They work their faith. On the whiteboard, I have an acronym for us. I propose that we can learn a lot about the spirit of the warrior through this acronym. This is who David was on the battlefield that day. When in the mind of first. Win in the mind first. The giants that we all face are here in our mind. Let's go to the Bible again because this is really awesome. This is what separates David from everyone else on the battlefield that day. David asked the other soldiers who were standing there on the battlefield that day, the same soldiers that would run up to the battlefront see Goliath, and then run away. He asked them, what will be done for the man who kills this Goliath and removes this disgrace from Israel? So you have an entire army talking about the problem and one person talking about the solution. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? That's the modern day warrior. What separates the warrior from every other archetype, every other class of society, is that you give a warrior a problem, a warrior starts to assess not the problem, but the solution. Everyone else is concerned with the Goliath. Everyone else, like we learn here in the Bible, is so concerned with the problem, with the size of the problem, with the size of Goliath. Not David. David's thinking to himself, what do I get when I kill this guy? <laughs> He's thinking about the solution. He knows he can take this guy down. He's remaining positive in his mind. He's already won in his mind. That principle is taught in every warrior tradition. Win first in your mind, and then you can face a thousand opponents. That's from Sun Tzu in The Art of War, one of the most traditional historical accounts of the warrior spirit ever written. It's preceded by the Bible. That's what David did that day. So warriors win first in their mind. Warriors affirm their source of strength. That's key. Warriors affirm their source of strength. As I already mentioned, as David is running towards Goliath, what does he say? I come to you in the name of God, and I will surely bring you down. We affirm our source of strength. This is what we talked about during the workout, in the heat of battle. If we go into any challenge based on our own strength, based on our own understanding, we're inherently limited. Yet if we go into these challenges and if we affirm our source of strength, then we can accomplish anything. Next, run towards the challenge. A warrior runs towards the challenge. Consider this. Consider a compass. A compass always points you due north. A compass is designed to assist you in the event you are lost. Well, as we go through life, we can utilize that same compass to help guide us. Imagine if every time you faced a challenge, every time there was opposition, in your life, imagine if your compass pointed you 
right towards that challenge. That's the compass of the warrior. You see, most people have the wrong compass. Most people, their compass is broken. There's a challenge in their life. Their compass is pointing them the other direction, away from the challenge. Yet the warrior, they use their compass and, oh, there's the challenge. They not walk, they run towards that challenge. I want to share with you an amazing story about one of the greatest warriors I've ever served with, Captain Michael Perry, 19th Special Forces Group. I met Captain Perry in 2004. I was at Fort Lewis, Washington in the middle of winter with Coach Glassman, the founder of CrossFit. We were there for a three-day CrossFit military certification with the 19th Special Forces Group, some of the greatest warriors our country has ever seen. Three days of grueling CrossFit workouts. Every workout was outdoor in the winter in Fort Lewis. Yeah, Josh is like, that was miserable. Miserable conditions. On the final day of this certification, Coach Glassman, the founder of CrossFit, brings everyone together and says, all right, we've got one more workout. There is one more evolution. Captain Perry, I want you to choose five of your soldiers who will compete in this workout. If these five soldiers successfully complete the workout under the time frame that I will impose, no one else has to do the workout. However, if one of the five is over the time limit, everyone has to do the workout. What's interesting about the group of soldiers in that moment, we were all in this position. <coughs> <laughs> we could barely stand up. It was raining. We'd been going at it for three days. We could barely stand up. The question in my mind was, how in the world will Captain Perry pick five soldiers? Please, Captain Perry, don't pick me. <laughs> that was my mindset. Here's what Captain Perry did. Captain Perry, during the brief, was also in this position, just like everyone else. Hearing that he would have to pick five soldiers, he went from this position to this position. Notice the inhalation. Once he was in this position, he looked at the group and said, it's okay, men. I got this one. I will do the final workout. With that, he bent down, hoisted two huge sandbags, and ran into the workout. What do you think I did and every other soldier? Exactly. We went from this position to this position. Even though we hadn't been called by Captain Perry to participate, he volunteered to fight the battle for us. We got our sandbags. Not five, every single one of us ran after Captain Perry into that workout. We were all collectively well underneath the required time frame. After that event took place, I went up to Captain Perry. I was a brand new second lieutenant, a butter bar in the army. My dream, my goal was to one day be a captain in the army. That was the best example of a warrior leader I'd ever seen. So of course I want to take this opportunity to learn from this great man. I went up to Captain Perry and said, Captain Perry, that was amazing. What did you do? How did you do it? You just transformed me and a group of soldiers who could barely stand up. What did you do? Here's what he said. He said, when I looked around the group, I saw every single one of us was in a position of defeat. And I knew I had to put my body into a position of power that my mind would follow. Isn't that beautiful? The key is I had to put my body into a position that my mind would follow, which is what he did. That was the order of events. He wasn't in this position and from this position speaking. He didn't say from this position, it's okay guys. I got this one. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> no way. He went like this, like a warrior. He took a deep breath in, 
Then once his body was in position, of course his mind followed. So did mine and everyone else there that day. Which happens to be exactly what David did when facing Goliath. Notice he wasn't standing, speaking, and then running. He ran, then spoke. He got his body into position. He started running, and with that momentum, he knew there was no turning back. He's engaged. He's bowed in. They've touched gloves. They have broke leather. <laughs> They're going to battle. And then he says, I come to you in the name of Jehovah. So we learn from the Bible that there's something about this body-mind connection. We get the body right, we get our posture right, our mind will follow. Next, remain positive and prepared. Remain positive. We have to stay positive. That is absolutely vital for the modern day warrior because we know all around us there will be opposition. There will be negativity. That was the account that day on that famous battle. The moment that David said, I can take this guy. All around him were people saying, Yay, David! Thank goodness you're here! No. All around him, people said, you can't possibly take this giant. You're, you're a nope, you're a shepherd, you're a boy. You can't do this. You're not up for this. All around him was opposition. All around him was negativity. So we have to be our own source of encouragement. We have to develop such intrinsic motivation, such belief in ourselves, based on what God says about us that we can go into battle despite what others may say around us. Also, consider this. Every time you say to yourself, I can do it, have you noticed that there's a little part of your mind that says, no, you can't. <laughs> What's that all about? Isn't that interesting that whether or not we're in a position like David, where there are in fact other people who are telling us you can't do it. We might be all alone facing our own Goliath, yet there might still be some voices we have to contend with. Those voices are the voices between our ears, the voice in our own mind telling us, no, you can't. Therefore, if there's a voice in our mind telling us, no, you can't, how do we discern that voice from the voice of truth? That's the age-old question that all warriors have been striving to ask and answer since the beginning of time. How do we discern the voice of truth? Well, we memorize, we meditate upon the Word of God. That is the voice of truth in our life. Case in point, one of my dear friends, a true mentor, someone that Josh and I really look up to, Mark Devine. Mark Devine was a 20-year Navy SEAL who now teaches the warrior spirit, who now teaches people how to develop the warrior archetype in their life. He told me something once that was absolutely profound. This continues to take on greater and greater significance in my life. Mark told me, Greg, a warrior has to be skillful both in action and non-action. A warrior has to be skillful both in movement and stillness. That is profound. We look to David, to the pinnacle warrior, David, because David was skillful both in action and non-action. David was skillful both in movement and stillness. He's proven himself on the battle. We know based on what he did that day, 
That was a skilled warrior. That was someone who had physically mastered their craft. Yet, what we also know when we really dig in to the scripture about David is that David spent an equal amount of time in stillness, in meditation. We also know something very unique, something very, I think, motivating about David. Do you know what God said about David? God said in Acts about David, David is a man after my own heart. He does whatever I ask of him to do. Get this, in the Bible, the word heart was often a metaphor for what we now understand as our subconscious mind. In many respects, therefore, God was speaking and God was saying about David, David's mind is like my mind. I love his mind. I love the way David thinks. Isn't that motivating? To think like David, to have a heart like David. What about David's mind was so loved by God? Stillness. The fact that David could become still. David, in his own words, tells us this. In his own words. David, of the 150 Psalms in the Bible, is credited with writing over half of them. One of which David wrote that I love the word of God. I meditate on his decree. I meditate on his decree, on the word of God. David would meditate on the word of God. And David was exceptionally skilled in warfare, in battle tactics. He had both. As we were approaching our second evolution, I proposed what we could use right about now is a mantra, is a tool for the mind to help strengthen and focus our mind. One of the tools, one of the mantras that I want to now propose to you comes from David. One of the Psalms that David wrote was this, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Isn't that nice? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. What a great mantra. What a great affirmation. Because what we know about that battle that day is that it took equal part. David was skillful both in action and non-action. What about his action allowed him to be so successful? The quality of his thinking the stillness, the serenity, the focus, the concentration of his mind. Years after that battle, when he was writing the Psalms, he wrote perhaps his secret to success. He was asking God to create within him a clean heart, which metaphorically meant a clean mind. Before we conclude, breathing. The breath is intimately connected to the quality of our thinking. The breath is intimately connected to the quality of our speaking. The breath is intimately connected to the quality of our action. In fact, we come back to the whiteboard, to the acronym, the I in being a warrior is inhale. Take a deep breath. The breath allows us to observe the conditions that are taking place around us. The breath as we inhale allows us to become present. Every time you breathe, when you're aware of the fact you're breathing, you are in the present moment, which is so important because what's the tendency of our mind, an undisciplined mind? The tendency of the undisciplined mind is to jump into the future, to worry about the future or to regress to the past. 
and to wrestle with the past. Neither of which we can do anything about because we're right here, right now. Well, guess what? So is the breath. We take a breath, we connect to the breath, we become present. The breath. The breath is our constant companion. How many of you, therefore, know how to breathe? <laughs> I was asked that same question, and my response was the same as yours. I was asked that question on two occasions. The first time I was asked, do you know how to breathe? I was an agent with the DEA. A gentleman named Dave Grossman asked me if I know how to breathe. Dave Grossman was a 20-year Army Ranger. There he was asking me if I knew how to breathe. My thought that day when he asked me if I knew how to breathe was, of course I know how to breathe. I've been breathing my whole life. I'm breathing right now, as a matter of fact. Who are you to ask me if I know how to breathe? Well, it turns out the <laughs> skill that David taught me, I really needed. The tool that he taught me, I have utilized to this day with resounding success. I want to share this tool with you. This is a very powerful breathing practice. This is that practice that essentially yokes and joins everything together. Let's begin by sitting up very, very tall in your seat. Really straighten your back. Think to the story of Captain Perry, Captain Michael Perry. He took a posture that he knew his mind would follow. So sit up in your chair, sit like a warrior, straight back, beautiful, roll the shoulders back, and just begin to be aware of the fact that you're breathing. Just take some deep breaths. Specifically, breathe through the nose, deep breaths through the nose. Nice. Now, let all the air out, exhale through the nose, Beautiful. Now, inhale for a four count. Two, three, four. Hold the breath. Two, three, four. Exhale through the nose. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Hold. Two more rounds. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Hold. Last round. Inhale. Hold the breath. Exhale. Hold the breath. Nice, now just take a deep breath in. Natural, slow breath out. In your mind, repeat your mantra. A possible mantra I propose today, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Put a new and right spirit within me. When I was with the DEA, I went through an amazing school called the U.S. Navy Land Warfare School. This was in the desert outside of El Centro, California. This was a course that was led and participated in with Navy SEALs. Amazing warriors. I was way out of my league with these guys. These were the best of the best. One of the drills we were working on was known as Land Warfare Platoon Patrol. We were patrolling across a vast desert in the middle of the Imperial Valley. We're learning a skill called React to Contact. As we're on patrol, an enemy would ambush the element. 
We couldn't initially see the enemy. All we knew is we were taking rounds. What we were trained to do as the rounds broke out is drop to the ground. There we are on patrol, bang, 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 shots rang out. We don't know where the enemy is, but we drop to the ground. Once we drop to the ground, the next tactic we were taught is to come online. Because up to that point, the formation of the element was in a triangle. Once we go down, as we take fire, that triangle comes online. Now you've got all the good guys online, so everyone's weapon is pointed the same direction. Yet, we still have no idea where the enemy is. Everyone's adrenaline, everyone's heart is racing. The leader of the element does something very, very important. The leader of the element, initially online with the other soldiers, takes a breath, low crawls back away from the line, pokes their head up, and looks around. They orientate the element towards the enemy. Then they direct the element into the fight. They would say, shift left, shift right, giving direction, letting the element know where the enemy is and what direction to take. The reason I loved that school, that drill in particular so much, that once again, looking to the warrior tradition, is a perfect example of how to navigate life. We're up against a challenge. We start to take rounds. There's a Goliath that we face. Dropping to the ground is a metaphor for becoming still. Just be still for a moment. The next step is take a breath. The next step is use your words to give direction to your life. So we base that example, that beautiful example, that's modern day US Navy SEAL land warfare. We use that example to understand the story of David and Goliath. We use that example to understand how to navigate how to strategically be a warrior in life. Well, we face a Goliath. What's the next step? What about the body in that moment is so important? What did David do? What did Captain Perry do? We put our body into a position we knew our mind would follow. Have you ever noticed your body language when you're having negative self-talk? Isn't it interesting? You're having negative self-talk. You could look across the parking lot and identify someone in a crowd who in their mind is speaking negatively because they look like this. That's how they walk around. I guarantee you, you're walking around like this. Your mindset is not, I'm having a great day. <laughs> I believe in myself and I love myself. Right? That's not how we walk when we talk that way. When we're talking in self-affirming ways, when we're repeating the word of God in our mind, this is our posture. Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, put a new and right spirit. I can do all things in Christ who strengthened me. This is our posture. Therefore, we can put our body into a position to help discipline our mind. Now we know the power of the breath. Taking that one deep breath helps to center the mind as well. Then that critical element to really engage the mind, the body, the spirit is the word, the spoken word. We use those three skills together. We're living with a great deal of warrior spirit. Well, my friends, the way I like to begin and then end these ministries is of course with prayer. And there's something about praying in a circle that is so powerful. So let's just stand up. We'll make a circle here in the gym. Father God, thank you so much for this wonderful day that we've shared together. God, we're grateful for the opportunity we had to develop our body, to develop our mind, and we're most grateful, God, for our opportunity today to gain greater understanding of your word 
your presence, your love for us. God, help us to be more like David as we go through the ebb and flow of our life. God, when we face our Goliath, whatever that Goliath might be in our life, help us to have an unshakable faith in you. Help us to believe in ourselves, God, not on our own understanding of how strong we think we are. God, help us to believe in ourselves based on how strong you made us, God. Help us to always seek you first, trusting, God, that when we seek you first, you provide everything else that we need. All right, Father God, we also want to lift up and ask a blessing upon the parts of our country that have been challenged and that are dealing with the horrific storm that recently took place in Texas, specifically those people who are in the public safety sector. We ask a blessing upon them during this challenging time. God, thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. We love you. We seek you, God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you all so much.